Good afternoon. My name is Sean Norris. I'm the Director of Platform Architecture for VMware covering Asia Pacific and Japan. And it's my pleasure to come to you virtually and remotely today uh, from my home office and talk to you about five aspects of container strategy. Now, before we jump in, I just want to acknowledge that uh, these are interesting times and uh, I'm sure like me, you may be working from your home office, but I trust that what we're seeing across industry, even in these interesting and challenging times, you'll find useful and you might find a few things you can take back and apply in your organization. So with that, let's jump straight in and let's look at five aspects of your container strategy. So first off, just a few seconds about me. These are some of the organizations that I've been with in the past prior to joining VMware and uh, notably JP Morgan Chase and Standard Chartered Bank here in Singapore. If you uh, like what I have to say or want to have a conversation further about anything uh, shared today, feel free to interact with me on Twitter uh, where my handle is at Sean Norris. Now, before we jump in and talk about container strategy, you might be thinking to yourself, well, what is VMware here today talking about Kubernetes. So why, why is VMware talking about Kubernetes? Well, you know, we've recently launched VMware Tanzu and Tanzu is the coming together of three really interesting companies and, and groups of teams. Um, we've got Heptio, which includes two of the three founders of Kubernetes. We've got Pivotal, uh, where I've come into VMware from, um, where we have years of experience running containers in production at scale. And we have Bitnami, who for years have run the most successful library of open source package projects. And so the combination of these things together gives us VMware Tanzu. And very shortly, this is going to be the only thing remotely resembling a sales pitch in this presentation. Um, VMware Tanzu is going to allow you to build, run, and manage modern applications. And so the build part of that is going to be modern software supply chain how you get code into production easily. We expect Tanzu to help you run Kubernetes everywhere. And we want you to be able to manage multiple clusters of multiple flavors, maybe with multiple teams involved as well. And so all of this is coming together in VMware Tanzu. If you haven't heard of it already, you're gonna hear a lot about this in the future. So enough sales pitch, let's jump in and talk about container strategy. So first off, let's cover quickly where what we're actually going to look at today. We're gonna to have a brief history of how as an industry we got to this point. We're going to have a look at why um, I think containers are a big deal and why I would suggest you ought to think so as well. And we're gonna look at these five specific aspects uh, very briefly. Um, really, when we talk about containers, we're really now talking about Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is both a platform and a chance to reorganize. And it's really designed for new ways of working and then we're going to finish off by looking at, is Kubernetes a strategic goal in itself? Then if you're interested in embarking on this journey or accelerating your journey towards containers and Kubernetes, how can you get started? And maybe how can VMware Tanzu help? So let's jump straight in. You know, if we think of the last five decades of computers, and we're not going to spend much time on this, the overwhelming uh, thing I want you to take away from this introduction is that the minimum unit of compute and the minimum cost to get started computing has steadily dropped over the last five decades. If you asked folks in the 1980s, um, is something going to come and displace the bunch of companies that was, you know, Burroughs, Univac, NCR, Control Data, and Honeywell? Well, really none of those are household names anymore for anything to do with computing. Um, if we move on a decade, the 1990s, where I kind of started my career, was really the rise of x86 computing. Intel microprocessors became the norm. The internet began, or at least began to be used in full, and we really saw the version 1.0 of the dot-com boom. If we roll forward to the 2000s, well, here we saw people taking physical servers and slicing them up into virtual ones. And that's probably how you best know VMware. And you know that really became mainstream through the 2000s. We also saw the emergence of this idea of public cloud, a 
of running API-driven infrastructure uh, on someone else's premises, and also the first generation of uh, systems management automation tools for, for infrastructure. We roll forward to the decade we've just finished with the 2010s, we saw cloud computing go from a, an edge niche that maybe a few startups and really leading edge or bleeding edge companies were using to something that is really mainstream now. We see this as billions of dollars a year of business of folks uh, spending money in the hyperscale public clouds. We also though, in the middle of the decade, saw the emergence of this idea of Docker and then Kubernetes. So now, as we look forward, like what is going to define the 2020s, the decade that we're just starting? Well, beyond some massive changes to our lifestyle as a result of the, the current virus situation that we're all anxious about, if, uh, from a computing point of view, the widespread migration to containers looks as likely a bet as I can see. And when, when I talk to customers across our region and hear from my colleagues globally, many companies are thinking about how they can move away or augment their existing infrastructure with containers. So with that background and context, why do containers matter at all? Why are they a big deal? Well, uh, from the Pivotal team that I was part of previously, and now at VMware, we think of infrastructure particularly in terms of five S's. The things that when we talk to CTOs and CIOs, these are the things that matter to them in terms of their technology capability. You know, speed, can you go faster? Can you provide things faster to developers when you need them? And when you look at things starting up in a container, well, it can start up in, in sub-second time, sometimes only a few seconds, whereas virtual machines are still more like starting a traditional server, often takes minutes to start them up. And then if we look at scale, one of the ideas that really caught on as public cloud started to become widespread was this idea of having auto scaling applications. Rather than provisioning for your peak load, you provision for a lower base load, but then you have the application respond to demand and add more compute infrastructure to handle that load as you go. And so Kubernetes and containers allow ops teams to easily auto scale uh, apps that have been written to take advantage of that. Whereas with virtual machines, auto scaling was something that came later and there's still a lot of traditional installations of virtual machines and traditional applications running on those virtual machine farms that don't have that capability yet. And so, you know, if we're keeping score, we'd really, we'd really score speed and scale on the side of Kubernetes and containers. Now, stability, what do containers give us with stability? Well, Kubernetes has self-healing built in as a core component. It has these control loops that if you expect two containers to be running for your deployment or pods in Kubernetes language, it will always make sure you've got two running. If one of them dies, if the underlying node that your pod is running on disappears, it will try and schedule another pod to replace it. And this is just a built-in first order characteristic of Kubernetes that you get self-healing baked in. Now, these capabilities are really powerful, but they're also quite new and they take some new skills from people. So there, there is a tinge of caution to this. Whereas we look at virtual machines and these have evolved over the last 20 years to be really tried and true. And, you know, capabilities like vMotion and, uh, such like for high availability are, you know, multiple generations of, of upgrades and improvements having been applied to them and they work really well. The interesting thing about that is though that that often requires manual intervention to fail over uh, to a different host, not always, but, and it really depends on the operator. The, the ability to have stability baked in is certainly there as a possibility but it's not guaranteed in the same way that self-healing is in a Kubernetes cluster. So, you know, if I kind of score stability, I'd say, I think eventually Kubernetes will surpass what's available on virtual machines. But today, certainly a lot more of the world's revenue generating mission critical applications are still running on virtual machines. And 
so I, I would score that one a tie between you know sort of the new world and virtual machines. Then if we look at sustainability or the ability to operate, um, well, Kubernetes, because it deals with containers as its kind of first order way of deploying applications, you, you need to use an infrastructure as code approach when you're deploying your application to Kubernetes. It needs that, that Docker file or equivalent. There's gonna be a YAML manifest of essentially infrastructure code describing to Kubernetes what you expect to, to have deployed, you know, defining those infrastructure objects, getting them running. We hear a lot of people talking about GitOps. This is where no longer are you using a version control like Git just to store your software source code for your application, but you're actually storing your infrastructure source code, all of your Kubernetes deployments and ingresses and pods, uh, and all of the other aspects of deploying it, you're, you're storing that in a version control like Git. And so you're actually making infrastructure changes by doing a pull request or doing a version change in Git, which will automatically flow through to your infrastructure. Well, if we think of that in comparison to the VM world, VMs are often susceptible to you know, configuration drift, lots of manual activity. When I was uh, working for uh, you know, a large financial services institution, um, th these were major concerns. Are the things running in production what we expect them to be and how do we know? Well, because you, you can trace in Kubernetes straight back to code, I expect over time more and more people are going to go to this because of the, the reduced capacity to have configuration drift and the reduction in requiring people to go in and do things manually. We know that if manual tasks get done enough times, eventually there will be mistakes. In the past, I think we maybe took the view of blaming the operator and calling that human error. I think uh, a lot of teams are more enlightened these days and realize that it's actually the system we need to blame. It's actually the allowance for manual activity in the first place that we need to eliminate. Kubernetes has a lot of promise in helping us do this. And so, you know, if I look at sustainability or the ability to operate in a modern way, I think containers and Kubernetes are, are winning in that column as well. Now, security is an interesting one as we hit point five here. The isolation boundaries between virtual machines are really tried and true um, and have been tested over multiple generations. And so the isolation between running containers on a machine is just not the same level of security. This is one of the things that's causing teams to have to run multiple clusters, because even though you can set up a virtual cluster in Kubernetes, it's called a namespace, you don't necessarily have the same guarantees of full isolation and segregation between namespaces that you would between, for example, uh, between different virtual machines running on uh, VMware and vSphere. So, you know, really at this point, there's a lot of work to do around the Kubernetes and container space and security. Um, you know, not insurmountable tasks, but I think if we're, if we're scoring honestly here, I think VMs for truly mission critical applications still win in the security baked in, particularly around the isolation between virtual machines. Well, you know, hopefully this gives you a bit of an overview of why containers and Kubernetes are getting so much attention in the industry. And, you know, this brings me to kind of my first aspect of, as, as you think about designing a container strategy or a Kubernetes strategy, well, you know, what is it? Um, Kubernetes has sprung up from a, an internal project at Google, which was then open sourced. And this really represents the way Google ran infrastructure for a number of years internally. And, by open sourcing it, a vibrant open source community has sprung up around this project. And so because it's owned by the whole community, um, people feel comfortable in using it because they don't feel they're going to be locked into a single vendor. Um, we've also seen a number of other competing container scheduling competitors like Mesosphere, Docker themselves, they've all essentially given up and have now admitted that Kubernetes is is the winner in this space. And they're all supporting Kubernetes to some extent or another. Um, we're quite confident that Kubernetes is the future of infrastructure um, as a way to schedule workloads. And for some of the benefits we just talked about on the previous slide, we think it's, 
you know, the argument over which container scheduler is going to win, we think is over. And we think that uh, Kubernetes is the, the future direction of containers and container scheduler. So on to our second aspect, you know, containers is a platform. And as I share these aspects, one of the um, things I want to do is also share some further reading material you can go have a look at um, that I think explains it in much more detail and depth than I can do in a 20 minute talk. So one of the interesting aspects is that Kubernetes is an API. Now, why are platforms important? Why are APIs important? If you want to understand the impact they can have on your organization, I recommend you have a look at this book called Accelerate by Dr. Nicole Forsgren, Jez Humble, and Gene Kim. Um, three of the smartest folks in the industry when it comes to uh, DevOps and new modern ways of working. And in this book, they go through really extensive detail backed up with real, real world data and metrics around how these new ways of working can help you build and scale a, a high performing world-class technology organization. So one of the things that come out of the, comes out of this research in this book is this idea of uh, four big metrics or a, a high level scorecard on the way to uh, assess your team's performance. And rather than these things being uh, technically related, these really map back to your business and the capability of your business. So in a nutshell, these are related to throughput and stability. And so you really need both if you're operating a modern environment. And let's look at throughput for a moment. If, if you're, uh, the, the Accelerate book suggests two metrics to look at for throughput. One is the frequency of changes to production. So how often do you ship code to production? And then, you know, how long does it take each change to production to go from the developer checking it in to being used by a customer in a production capacity? So, you know, how, what's your lead time? And then what's your frequency? And, you know, we've worked with teams that have gone, for example, from once a month deployments down to many times a day. And the impact that has on their business can be profound. Um, but going fast is not enough on its own. You must do that with safety and stability. And so the stability side of the big four metrics is really around what is your failure rate? How often when you change production, does it break something or do you have an interruption in service? And then in those events, which hopefully are rare, how fast do you recover? What is your time to recover from a failure? And so put together, these high level metrics are actually things that your business will care about. The non-technical people in your organization will actually go, yes, I'd like you to deploy a new value faster. And I'd like it to take less time every time you do. And I would really hope that as you deploy new value for our customers, that things break less and less. And that in the rare event that it breaks, that you recover it quickly. So I'm really sold on these big four metrics. I'd recommend them and I'd recommend this book for you to have a look at. Um, on this topic of DevOps, a lot of people talk about DevOps wanting to adopt it. And I'm convinced that DevOps or working together better, if you like, is really an output of some inputs you could rather focus on. So, you know, DevOps is not something you can wave a magic wand and say, we're all DevOps now. Um, really what they dive into in the book is areas like effective use of cloud, you know, continuous delivery. What do the specific practices of continuous delivery look like? Um, using infrastructure as code, which pulls us back to Kubernetes, and then cross-functional teams. Rather than having teams that are siloed and doing just one job, you need teams that have an end-to-end -end view of how value gets delivered. And so Kubernetes is, specifically architected in a way that I think it can help with all of these areas. So that takes us nicely to our third aspect. You know, in more traditional organizations, um, there's usually a separate team for each different type of technology. Um, I can remember in a large organization I was working for, we had a production incident. And in order to solve it, we spun up a, a conference call bridge we had to page 13 different team leaders in to help troubleshoot and figure out where the, the fault lay, if you like, what, 
what part of the stack was not working. And that was siloed into 13 different teams. And that's not particularly unusual uh, when we go and look at you know, traditional organizations still in industry. And so if we just take compute, storage, networking, and security as, you know, you'll find these teams in most large orgs. Well, Kubernetes, if you're deploying an application, you're going to be choosing what compute you'd like, you, you know, a Docker image, you're going to be choosing what storage to use, maybe a persistent volume and what flavor of persistent volume that is. You're going to be making networking decisions around, well, how am I going to control my ingress? What sort of overlay networking am I going to choose between my pods? Um, you know, have I designed it so that um, am I going to use external load balancers? Am I going to use cloud load balancers? There's lots of networking decisions you need to make in Kubernetes, and they're not all straightforward. And then security. How am I going to decide how many clusters to have? How am I going to uh, decide what namespaces to put things in? There's, there's a number of different um, aspects to security that you need to take in. And often, all four of these areas and more come together in one single YAML manifest file for a deployment. And so if you're still organized in a way where you need four separate teams to come, other, to come together and write that file together, you're gonna struggle uh, to, to actually see the speed up and the moving fast that might be possible. So you know, I wanna introduce the second book that I think you'll find interesting. This is a book called Team Topologies by uh, two folks in the EU, Matthew Skelton and Manuel Pei. And this is probably the most impactful book I've read in the last one to two years. And one of the highlights I wanna share from the book is this idea of the reverse Conway maneuver. Now, Conway's law, um, which you've probably heard of, it's more, it's more a social observation than a hard and fast law like, you know, uh, Newton's law of gravity or something like this, but it makes the observation that if we're designing software and we have a particular organizational structure, the software we design will most often reflect our organizational structure. Now, the example that often gets uh, shared is that, you know, there was apparently a time when four separate teams were asked to collaborate together and build a compiler and they came back with a four pass compiler. So that gives you an idea uh, kind of back to these siloed teams working on Kubernetes together is going to be a challenge. And so the idea of the reverse Conway maneuver is if you want a particular outcome with your software architecture and you wanna build modern infrastructure and applications, consider actually changing your organization in advance maybe bringing people from these separate teams to work together in a new platform team, do that in advance. And then things like building deployments and building YAML files together for Kubernetes will be much more straightforward. So highly recommend this book. I think you'll find it really interesting and uh, it was a great read. But on top of that, you know, Kubernetes is also best if you adopt some new ways of working. So I wanna introduce making work visible. And this is by a woman named Dominica de Grandis. I've had the pleasure of meeting her at uh, a couple of conferences. And she's really a world-class expert in modern ways of working. And she goes through and talks about the traditional time thieves in organization. Things like unplanned work and repetitive work and so, you know, we've already talked about how silos and Kubernetes don't mix well. We've, you know, had a look at that, but even if you bring the team together, you're going to want to look at new ways of working. And this kind of brings us to this point of talking about why declarative work may be better than imperative. And so, it, particularly in programming languages in the past, we would often specify all the individual mechanics and directions of how to perform a task. Whereas new declarative models say, here is the end state that I'd like something to be, keep it that way. And so Kubernetes is really interesting in this regard because it uses a declarative model, or at least it prefers that, 
um, you can make some imperative commands, but the, the idea behind Kubernetes is that you're, you're making declarative calls to an API and saying my deployment, my application in its running state should look this way, please keep it that way. And so for that reason, I'm excited about Kubernetes because I think it's gonna be able to help you eliminate manual work. It's going to help you eliminate repetitive toil in your teams. And these are the things that make people enjoy their jobs less. Um, if, if folks get to spend their time solving hard problems and really having their minds stretched and challenged, work tends to be more interesting and exciting. If you're doing the same drudgery over and over again, just you know, toil and work that doesn't really engage your mind, uh, your, your level of engagement, your level of productivity tends to suffer over time. So on top of the aspects we've looked at, I, I like this idea that as you're maybe adopting a new organizational uh, style or, or even structure, um, that you also think of adopting some new ways of working. And I think if you're looking in this direction, this book here from Dominica de Grand is called Making Work Visible is an excellent place to start. So let's look at our fifth aspect, which is really, is Kubernetes strategic in itself? Are you going to achieve business outcomes simply by adopting Kubernetes? I would argue no. Um, why not? Well, your customers likely won't or don't care that you're running Kubernetes. They are customers of your organization because of the value you add for them. They may interact with that value through a mobile application, through a website, through a call center, through in-person shops or branches, but they interact with you because of the value you add for them, because of the products and services that they enjoy from you, not because of what's running in your data center. Unless you're a data center company or a Kubernetes company selling Kubernetes itself and that's your product, Kubernetes is probably not in itself a strategic outcome for your organization. And so my colleague, James Waters, who's our Tenzu CTO uh, in Palo Alto, he talks about this concept of the value line. And you know, above the value line are things in your organization that your customers actually interact with, see, use, care about. Below the value line are things that are uh, not as important to the customer in terms of visibility, but still very important to make sure that things above the value line actually work. So the strategic play around things like infrastructure and uh, things like Kubernetes, even though Kubernetes is so important to improving the efficiency and the ability to deliver faster technology, better, safer, happier, um, it is not a strategic outcome on its own, I would argue. So because it won't differentiate you against your peers simply to be running Kubernetes, my suggestion is you consider buying Kubernetes from a trusted partner rather than building it. You know, um, at VMware, we're biased in that. We would like you to come and have a conversation with us and buy it from us if you decide to. Um, if you decide you want to build it, we have some interesting consulting services as well. But this is not particularly a sales pitch. This uh, would be advice I'd give anyone in the industry, whether they're our customer or not. That I think building DIY infrastructure stacks yourself, the long-term costs of running it outweigh the upfront costs of, of buying a well-constructed, curated platform uh, from a trusted partner. So that kind of wraps up our, our five aspects. Let's, let's look at some ways that you can get started by way of kind of wrapping this talk up. Um, you know, I would say you wanna start small and iterate. The days of big bang approaches where you say, we're gonna spend a year building an all singing, all dancing platform, but no one's gonna get any value or any access to the platform for a year. Don't do that. See what you can build in a month, get some feedback as you build from your developers and, and see what you can build and iterate on to build a working platform that's delivering value sooner. And then as you look at your organization, consider seeding a small Kubernetes platform team. Maybe go read the Team Topologies book, have a few people in your organization read it, and really look at the value that the world's best companies these days are getting from this idea of platform engineering and bringing cross-functional people together from various parts of your technology organization. And then I would say, read Accelerate. Read Dr. Forsgren and her uh, collaborators' work 
and look at the big four metrics as your high level scorecard. Um, if you agree that Kubernetes, while it's really important to improving efficiency in your organization, it's probably not a strategic outcome on its own. It's not something that is going to differentiate you in the marketplace because you're running it. Then go choose an enterprise partner who can help you get to running meaningful apps in production faster. And then the other thing I'd say is consider multi-cloud from day one. Cloud, you know, we think of now as everywhere from your data center to a public cloud all the way to the edge. And with the emergence of 5G, we think there's going to be a lot more interesting applications that the huge bandwidth increase of 5G is going to run. And there's going to be a lot more applications that need to run and process data right at the edge. Kubernetes has an interesting part to play there as well. And so as I wrap up, I want to leave you with uh, this quote from someone I really look up to, John Smart at Deloitte in the UK. He said, if you want to do an agile transformation, don't. Focus on better value, sooner, safer, and happier, and you will end up transforming to have agility. So with that, I thank you very much. Um, thanks to the organizers for inviting me, and have a great day.